Hi, it's Philip Seagraves. We're back for part two of our real estate investment problem. Thinking about buying a quadruplex, a small apartment building with four units, and should we make the decision? Should we make a decision to do it or not? All right, we've already gone through setting up our spreadsheet, setting up the basic variables, and now we're going to move on to um, taking a look at our cash flows and what those mean to us. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. All right, if you remember, we have all of our basic assumptions set up in this first part of the spreadsheet. And now we want to determine, well, what does this mean to us from a cash flow standpoint? Are we going to are we going to be making any money? It probably makes most sense to go ahead and start a new sheet. And we'll call this one our before tax cash flow. And since we're going to be taking a look at a multi-year investment here, let's just go ahead and set that up. Year one, year two, and year three. And the income that we would receive on a real estate investment, the total rent times the total number of units that we could possibly receive, we would typically call that our potential gross income. or a PGI and that's going to be a pretty straightforward calculation. We're going to multiply the number of units that we have times the rent times the number of periods per year. So the first thing we'll do is point to the number of units times the rent times and to do a multiplication I simply enter an asterisk and then we're going to say 12 and we get $46,800. Now if you recall, rent is going to be increasing at a rate of 2%. So to get the next year's rent, all we'll need to do is multiply the previous year times 1 plus that growth rate. And I'll use a little Excel trick right here by hitting F4 to lock that in so that when I drag it across to this other cell it works again and it does the same formula. It multiplies this value times the F5 value from the first sheet which was over here which was our growth rate. And let's get these all consistent looking like dollars and we see that we have 46,800, 47,736, and then 48,690 as our potential gross income. That's what. That's if everybody lived there the whole year, everybody paid rent, there wasn't any vacancy, and there also wasn't any credit risk. Uh, so people were living there but just not paying. So, what would our vacancy be? Well, let's calculate what that would be. So our vacancy is going to be this value times our vacancy rate. Our vacancy rate was 9% and I'm going to do that same trick again. Hit F4 and it'll lock that value in so that when I drag this across it's going to give me my vacancy cost. Now that's a negative value which is what I would normally do. And then let's see, so my effective gross income or EGI is going to be my potential gross income minus vacancy and gives me 42,588. Now I'll just drag that across and copy it as well. So now I have what is called my effective gross income. Now what about my expenses? So now I'm going to subtract out all my expenses. So let's take a look at first my fixed expenses then we will have my variable expenses then we will have reserves so my fixed expenses for the first year my fixed um, expenses were going to be simply the value that we had had from our previous sheet which was five thousand and my variable and my reserve expenses were fifty eight and thirty six hundred to get those there I just simply copied this cell down and it did the same thing. It copied the reference to this other cell and this one copied the reference to that other cell. If you can see the value here for reserves is 
sheet 1, cell F9. I go back here. I have sheet 1, which is where I am, and cell F9 is my reserves for replacement. Now I have my next values are going to be multiplied by fixed variable and reserve replacement growth rates. Fixed variable and reserve replacement growth rates. So this 2.5, 2.5, and, and this 3%. So, what I'll simply do is multiply that value, or I'll add, or I'm sorry, I'll multiply that by 1 plus, and then we'll go over here and find that fixed expense growth rate, and we'll lock that in with F4, close our parentheses, and hit enter. We'll get that into a nice format, and we'll just drag that across, and we can also drag it down because I've locked those cells in and we are, you can see if I double click it'll point, it's showing me this 5800 times sheet 1 times dollar sign F dollar sign 10. That Those dollar signs mean that when I drag the cell it's going to keep pointing to the same cell instead of changing that reference on the other sheet. If this is an unfamiliar part of Excel you may want to take a look at, at cell references in the uh, help or your text on Excel. But we can see sheet 1, F10, is going to be our growth rate for variable expenses. Here's F10 right here, sheet 1, F10. Okay, so now we have our total expenses. Let's go back to the other sheet, and we will, let's sum those up. These are our operating expenses. And we'll use the handy Excel sum function and highlight these values. 14,400 are our expenses for the first year. I'll drag this across to get our expenses for the other two years. And now we want to calculate kind of the one of the key metrics for real estate investment is called net operating income or NOI. And that's simply going to be our effective gross income minus our operating expenses. And in this one we have 28,188. And to get the other two years, we'll just drag that right across. And we end up in the third year with NOI of 29,143 dollars or $29,179. Okay, now we have debt service. What is debt service? That means we got to pay the bank. So we are going to calculate our debt service. So how much are we going to be paying the bank? This is going to be our payment, our monthly payment times 12. So if we go back to our other sheet, we found out that our monthly payment is 1621.67. And if we go back to this sheet, all we'll need to do is multiply that value times 12. And we come up with a value of 19,460. Now we want to be able to drag that across again. So I'm going to put my cursor inside this F18 and hit my handy F4 key and now I can drag these across. Now since this one is already properly in a negative format I'm just going to add these two values and we will come up with our before tax cash flow. Now I'll copy that across for tax cash flow. All right, this is great. Okay, so on our building in our first year, we've made $8,728 approximately, and then we've made $9,219, and $9,719. So each year, we're doing a little bit better. And what we want to try to do now is figure out, well, what about after taxes? Because that's really what I care about. 
I want to know what I'm making after I've paid all my taxes. So let's take a look at what our we're going to be taxed on our net operating income, but there are some adjustments that, adjustments that we need that we get to make. So first thing we'll do is we'll go ahead and pull our NOI down here. So we're going to say equals, and we will point right to our NOI there, and we'll bring that across. But we never really spent those reserves. We just kind of set those aside. So we got to pay taxes on those. So we will. We're going to plus add those reserves back in there. And I'm going to copy that across. But we don't have to pay taxes on the amount of interest that we paid. So, but how much interest did we pay here? Now this gets a little bit complicated. We know what our payment is. But in order to find out what our interest is, we're going to have to use an amortization schedule, which is going to show us what our interest was for the whole year. But our interest is going down every single month. So we need to do a monthly amortization schedule to calculate correctly what our interest is. So how do we do that? Well, let's go ahead and set up another tab. It is going to be our amortization schedule for our loan. So. Let's get, uh, put a monthly amortization schedule, principal amount. So the principal amount of our loan, we're going to copy that from way back here from the beginning of our analysis. Our loan amount is there. And we are going to put a going to go ahead and put a monthly value in here for each of our periods. I'm going to hide. If you put a series of numbers in like that and then just drag them down, it will continue the series for you. So let's continue on down to our 36th month. And we remember how to do our payment. Our payment value is going to be our interest rate, which if we remember was um, 7% divided by 12. And then if you see the little tip that's given you here in Excel, the number of periods in PER is going to be the 30 years times 12. And now our present value is that same value that we had for our total loan, which is this loan amount right here. And so I'm just going to close those parentheses. And now we have our payment. Now that should be curiously familiar. It should match 1621.67. should be the same value that we had back here. Now in order to make sure that those values all stay the same, I'm going to need to lock those in. So each one of those values is going to need to be set as an absolute reference by hitting F4. So we know my payment's not going to be changing over the over the 36 uh, months. But what about my interest payment? So my interest payment is going to be some proportion of this total payment. Now Excel has a, a real handy function for interest payment as well. IPMT. And our rate is going to be the same thing that we worked with earlier, which is going to be our, again, our 7% divided by 12. And we're going to go ahead and lock these in as we go this time. And our, the period that we're wanting to get our payment for is the first period. So I'm just going to click here. And now we have the number of periods, which if we recall was our 30 divided by, I'm sorry, in this case, times 12. And then finally, our present value is going to be the value of the of the loan from the beginning. So we're going to click that and then hit F4 to lock that in again. And now we can see that almost all of this payment is interest. Let's just say payment, interest, 
in principle. Now we'll just drag that guy down and you should see that the interest payment is declining every single month as we would expect. If I were to drag that out 30 years we would see that go to nearly zero. So what about the principal? The principal is just going to be the difference between these two. So if we just take our payment and subtract the interest, we're going to have the principal. This is the amount of principal reduction that we had for each one of these periods. All right. So what happened in the first year? That's going to be our interest payment is going to be the total interest that we paid is going to be these first 12 months. So let's add those up. And then let's do the same thing. We'll copy that. And we'll put that right next to 24 here. And we'll copy that again and put it right here. So you can see that our interest payment for the first year, total of our interest payments is 19248 and 19045 And then it goes down to 18828 in that third year. So, let's just get that stuff put back in there then. And as we're going along, you've got to be careful of making mistakes. I just uh, caught myself in a couple of small mistakes. If you, if you notice in here when we were calculating this interest, I mistakenly pointed to, instead of pointing to the loan amount, I pointed to F20, which if you see back here is our depreciable base. I should have been pointing up here to F16. So let's go back in there and fix that. That should have been, I'm going to highlight that and go back here and should have been sheet F, sheet 1, F16. Now, that looks a lot better. We're going to highlight that and drag it down. It's easy to make mistakes. Another mistake that we want to keep an eye out for is the one that I've made in here. And when I took these cells over here and dragged them down, I, it didn't, because I locked these in with absolute references to F10, it did not properly multiply those by those growth rates on the other sheet. So if you take a look at what happened over here, I'm pointing to the growth rate for expenses here, the growth rate for expenses also here, and here, where those should be going down. So if I remove the dollar symbol from before the 10, and pull those down. We'll notice now that we have changed values here for the reserves. These will stay the same because if you remember they were both at two and a half percent growth. But this one was three percent so it should have been, these numbers should have been slightly higher. Okay so now we have our interest. So what was our total interest for the first year? We're going to go back to this other sheet now that we've got the correct values in here for our interest and our total. There's interest for the first year. Now interest for our second year is a little bit further down. Interest for our third year is down here at the bottom. So we also want to take away depreciation. One of the great things about real estate and other forms of capital, many forms of capital. We're going to do this straight line depreciation, which means we're going to just take the um, <clears throat> entire amount and divide it by evenly every year for the 39 and a half years. We can write off part of that uh, depreciation in value every year as we go along. So what is that depreciation going to be? Well, let's figure that out. We're going to go back to our our depreciable base here and we have our depreciable base and our cost recovery period so we'll take our depreciable base divide that by our cost recovery period and what we'll often do and we can talk about that in a moment is depreciate the cost of improvements as well in this case we come up with 
10,045. Well, we'll just assume those, those improvements were just straight up expenses and not improvements. So we're going to lock those in. It's like things like paint and you know short-lived uh, improvements that we're not able to depreciate over the life of the of the uh, building. So we'll have the same depreciation as 10,045 and 45 cents every year. And let's, to make these come out correctly, we're going to go ahead and put a negative sign in front of these so that we can just sum this column up. And so we have our NOI, we add back the reserves, we take away interest, we take away depreciation, and let's see what we come up with for our taxable income. And that's going to use that handy Excel function, the sum function. There's also a button on the toolbar for it, but sometimes it's good to just show how to do it the old-fashioned way. So now we have taxable income of 4758 in the first year, 55, 19, and 6303 in the third year. Okay, well that's great. So now we have, uh, we're going to come down to our final after-tax cash flow. Now this is what we typically care about as an investor, at least this is our, our annual take an annual look. So we have our before tax cash flow, which we know is from up here, equals before tax cash flow. We can just copy that across. And now we're going to have the tax impact. Now if you recall, we have our tax rates on our other on our other um, sheet, so we're going to multiply this taxable income times our investor's tax rate, and we're going to go ahead and lock that in, and we'll drag that, we'll drag that across, and what you'll see is it uses that tax rate and multiplies that by each of these values for taxable income in each one of those years, and now here we go after tax cash flow. This is it right here. I'm going to put some exclamation points because this is what matters. We're going to take our before tax cash flow and subtract our tax and we have our after tax cash flow. And to, to make an even bigger deal about it, I'll put a bold on it. I'll increase the font size a little bit because this is what matters, at least on an annual basis. Now on the three-year picture, we have another very important part of the picture to deal with. Now we're going to sell the thing at the very end and pay some capital gains taxes. And we'll cover that in part three.